Welcome to the Seth Joyner Show presented by Bet Parks. Hey, listen, man, there's two ways of looking at this thing. The Eagles got the win, and it didn't look that pretty. Um, San Francisco takes a fall. Dallas takes a fall. And things are looking good for the birds. Or you can look at it like, man, playing against this Dallas Cowboys, this, I'm sorry, this, they are, they are always there eternally on my mind for some reason or another. Playing against this New York Giants football team, there is no way that we should have blown them out, okay? All right, before we jump over on the negative side, let's get to the positives because there was some positive. Um, the Eagles yesterday on offense put up a total of 465 yards. Um, in the first half, they had 156 yards passing, 62 yards on the ground. And then they turned it up in the second half with um, 246 yards. Um, I felt like um, they committed a little more in some situations to um, DeAndre Swift. He turned it up. 300-yard um, passing day for Jalen Hurts, uh, no matter how you want to look at how he played. And then, you know, the running game, you know, put up some you know pretty impressive numbers um, with I want to say almost 150 yards rushing. Let me check my stats one more time before I, um, before I put out some misinformation. Um, yes, no, 170 yards total rushing. Oh, I, listen, I know a lot of that had to do, you know, with Jalen, you know, running around as well. But I thought that DeAndre Swift had a hell of a game, you know, in the second half when they actually decided to utilize him um, a little more. He had 28 first downs. That's huge. Um, they were eight for 15 on third down, an area, you know, where um, traditionally, you know, they've been pretty good. They're second in the league, and so they continue to do well there. An area of continued concern is they were two for five, um, two for five in the red zone again. Um, and that, you know, is an area where, you know, they've continued to struggle, you know, throughout the season. Um, defensively, I'm one of their better outings. You know, even though the game took the turn that it took, um, and we'll get to some of those things and some of those issues, you know, in conversation, um, they only gave up 186 yards passing. Um, I get it. It was the New York Giants. Um, 106 yards on the ground. Saquon had, you know, a little bit of a day um, once they committed to him. But the most important thing for the Eagles is they got off the field yesterday on third down. The Giants were only four for 14. Um, that's slightly above, um, you know, 35%. And that's really where, you know, you want to be as a defense. You know, our goal was always to be somewhere, you know, in the 33% range. Um, to me, that's where elite level defenses reside, somewhere around 35% or lower, um, just being able to get off the field. Brayden Colby, huge punt return. Um, I was really you know, rooting for this guy to, you know, get in the end zone. I got a, an ongoing bet with Mike Mistinelli that he's going to score. He's going to put it in the end zone at some point in time, you know, before this season is over. Um, but, you know, overall, the Eagles took care of what they needed to take care of. They won the football game. Um, but, you know, from the analytics side or from the analysis side, we got to, you know, deal with, you know, the elephant in the room, they continue to make mistakes that make games against teams that they should completely annihilate um, look like games down to the bitter end. And um, Tyrod Taylor came in and gave him a little shot in the arm. 
Uh, they made a couple of plays. The Eagles had, you know, quite a few um, snap throughs. Uh, it really, it, it's just five or six games, five or six plays every game with this football team. It just leaves you kind of scratching your head as to, you know, what the heck is going on? They've been talking about trying to get right all season long. And I think it's the mistakes more than anything. I mean, you can't, you can't, you know, fumble the ball coming out of the second half. You know, you've got momentum in the football game. You're up 20 to three. And you come out, you know, after halftime looking to score and really put this Giants team away. And you fumble away, you know, the opening kickoff of the second half. And you give the other team the ball on the 15 yard line. And three plays later, boom, they're in the end zone. Um, you know, the mistakes, not only on the quarterback's behest, taking a sack right there in that last possession, but also scrambling and not being self-aware enough to get out of bounds to stop the clock because you don't have any more timeouts left. You know, it was a fortuitous call on their, on for them that, you know, the Giants player was at the bottom of the pile, you know, delaying the ability for the referee to get the ball and reset it so that they could clock it and kick the field goal. But, you know, at the end of the day, that was just really, really bad management, not only on the on behalf of the coach, but on the behalf of, you know, the leader um, of the offense and your leader of the team. And that that's Jalen Hurts. I mean, he he is – you guys know that I've been a huge advocate for Jalen, you know, since the Eagles drafted him. Um, was extremely pleased to see his progress last year. But then you fast forward to this year, and he is making some uncharacteristically, um, you know, unintelligent decisions um, that's putting the Eagles in some precarious position. Now, luckily, you know, they were over to over, able to overcome it. But, um, you know, these are the types of things that they continue to talk about being able to clean up and game after game, they're an issue. You know, the turnovers absolutely kill you in the, in the National Football League now. You've got to take care of the football. There are some things that can't be helped. I don't blame Jalen Hurts for, you know, for the interception. Dallas got it slipped, or that ball's probably going to hit him dead in the chest. He got a nice little gain right there. But at the end of the day, when you look at, um, when you, look at um, you know, that play, that pass play, play before, that potentially could have been an interception. You know, he, he's, he, he looks to me <clears throat> like he goes through these, these points in the game where there's different objectives. Like in the first half, it seemed like it was, it, it was um, Devontae Smith's half. You know, he caught a lot of balls in the first half. I want to say, well, he didn't catch a lot, but he had three for 71 yards. Obviously, you know, the big 38-yarder for the touchdown. The explosive play that created on a little slant route, he turned into a 38-yard touchdown. Um, but 71 yards receiving by him in the first half. Um, in the second half, it seemed as though they were intent on pushing the ball to A.J. Brown. Now, you run your offense, or you, at least you're supposed to run your offense in a manner that, um, you know, you go through your progression and the guy that's open gets the ball. If the first guy in the progression isn't there, you move on to the next and to the next and so on. You know, and you're always trying to push the ball to the open guy. It seems to me like this offense gets bogged down at times when he's intent on throwing the ball to a specific person. Now, I tweeted during the game yesterday, I'm like, come on, man. You know, you are you are staring your receivers down in a lot of in a lot of scenarios as if the defense doesn't have eyes and they're not. They're not paying attention to where you're looking. As a defender, if I'm dropping in the zone, I'm trying to get to my landmark. I'm trying to peripherally see what's going on around me. But I'm also trying to see the quarterback because the minute he raises his arm, whichever way he's he's aiming, you know, when he raises his arm, I want to be breaking on the football, you know. And Jalen is making it easy for some of these, you know, some of these catches to be contested because he's staring the wide receivers down. He's not taking the ball knowing that he wants to go left and looking right and then coming back left. He's taking the ball and looking right there right now. And good defenders are going to cue in on that. Good defensive coordinators are going to cue in on that. And they're going to make it really, really difficult for him to play the type of football, the brand of football that he really wants to play. Um, 
defensively, um, you know, th this team, if, if you guys watch the um, the Ravens 49ers game last night, um, you guys saw some stellar linebackers play. I mean, both of those teams have got some grown men that play linebacker. Um, and, you know, I tweeted a couple of weeks ago, you know, to Harry Roseman talking about, you know, um, you know, these Baltimore Ravens linebackers, you know, and some of the, some of the linebackers on other teams. Um, you know, Shaquille Leonard, you know, had a pretty good first half. Second half, he looked to me like he was trying to guess, you know, where he was going to fit or trying to guess where they're actually going to run. They had to play a lot of four-man line yesterday because, you know, I get the sense that the Eagles are ranked uh, – where are they ranked defensively? They are ranked 27th in the National Football League versus the pass. You know, so there's a concern there to get that taken care of. Well, you know, when you're playing a five-man front, you guys have heard me say it so many times, when you're playing a five-man front, then what winds up happening, you're one guy less or one guy shy, you know, on the back end in the pass game. Even if you drop Hassan Reddick or you drop uh, Josh Sweater, you drop Nolan Smith in the coverage, you're still short because those guys, they don't really know what they're doing. They're dropping to a landmark, and that's all that they know, that they're supposed to drop and it turns into a four-man a four man situation. But the Eagles lived in a lot of four men, even on the goal line yesterday um, on Saquon Barkley's you know, touchdown. They were in a four man front. And it is just beyond, you know, comprehensible. They cannot stop the run out of a four man front. The linebackers don't know where to fit. That's going to be tonight. I know I've done it before, but I'm going to do it again. And I'm and our whiteboard 101. I'm going to show you guys, you know, where these guys are supposed to fit and what it's supposed to look like and why they're having such a hard time being able to get the run game under control. Um, I'm pleasantly surprised by what I'm seeing out of Keely Ringo. I think that, you know, a lot of people probably won't agree with me here, but I think even when Darius Slay comes back to this kid, you can't take him off the field. You know, he, he, you haven't heard his name. In two weeks, um, he had an interception to seal the game, and I think for his confidence sake, listen, one of these one of these cornerbacks, either either Slay or Bradbury, are going to be off this team next year. You got to get younger, in my opinion, at the cornerback position. And you've got some young guys, you know, that can play on the outside that hasn't got a lot of playing time because of what you're paying the starting two guys that have been average at best. Um, and they, they went back to the experiment yesterday at times of putting, um, of putting, um, Bradbury in the slot and they attacked him again. Luckily, you know, nothing big, but you know, they did go after him. The situations versus the tight end and situations against the third or the fourth slot guy, they moved him down inside. Um, these young guys are really starting to progress and starting to play well and getting their confidence up. And I think the most devastating thing that, you know, that the Eagles can do right now is pull those young guys off the field and go back to these veterans, you know, when Darius Slay is healthy. Now, you make the decision. You know, it's one or the other. But one of these guys clearly is having, you know, his uh, an extremely off year. And this is the only way that these guys are going to get a chance to to succeed and to grow, you know, in their rookie years and in the beginning of their of their careers, they have to play. They got to be in the game. Um, and you know, maybe James Bradbury needs a game or two off. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. I just know that he's struggling in every way conceivable. He's struggling to cover. He's struggling to tackle. He's just struggling. You know, and these young guys don't know any better. And sometimes, you know, ignorance is bliss. When it comes to things like this, you've got you put these guys out there and you just let them go, you let them play, you let them learn. Yeah, they're gonna make some mistakes. And the, and the Giants don't have wide receivers to write home about. You know, um, you know, Slayton made a hell of a play, and that's on um, Reed Blankenship to get his death in that situation because that's the only play in that situation that you can't give up. You know, you got to understand and know your speed as well. 
He's not a blazer. He's not a four, 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 three guy. You know, you got to give yourself the extra room to be able to get out of your your back pedal and get over and get that play covered. Um, but the Eagles have some talent, you know, at the you know at the cornerback position. These guys have just got to grow up, and you know, there's there's growing pains that come along, you know, with having to play young players. Um, now, I, I get the sense that what's going to wind up happening is that's not going to be the case. You know, with the Eagles, you know, they got to win the last two games, you know, to potentially get into, you know, the number two seed or one more trip up, you know, by um, the 49ers and they can find themselves, you know, in the number one seed if um, if Dallas can knock off the Lions this weekend. But um, once you get into the playoffs, I know that the mindset is probably going to be, hey, you know, these guys played in the Super Bowl last year. Both of these guys were Pro Bowl cornerbacks last year. You know, we, we need to go with the experience and go with what we know. Um, I don't know that I feel that way. You know, ask ask me that question in two weeks after they play two more games. Um, but right now, my mindset would be, you know, get these young guys as much experience as you can get them, you know, going into the playoff. And then where you have to play them, you have to play them because the older guys are either injured or not being Productive, then you don't have an issue putting them in there having to worry. Um, the other thing defensively, I don't know what has happened to you know our pass rush, but we're not just not getting to the quarterback like we have been. Um, you know, I told you guys last year that you know 72 sacks was an anomaly. Um, there was just no way that you could count on this defensive line to produce those types of numbers. I, I believe that you know. That Jalen Carter is going to be an upgrade over um, Javon um, Hargrave, um, you know. But the guys on the outside, Josh Sweat and um, and Hassan Reddick, are just not getting the type of pressure on the quarterback that you need them to get on. And you know, Tommy DeVito had been sacked like twenty something times, you know, in five games, and they couldn't get close to him. They couldn't get close to their 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 lack of discipline in the second half, not understanding the situation where you got Tommy DeVito, who is an athletic and can move. Then you go to Tyrod Smith, a guy, Tyrod Taylor, excuse me, who you know can move and has great athleticism and great skill set. You know, and we got guys that are rushing above the quarterback, opening up that lane between the defensive tackle and the defensive ends. Um, Coming down inside without communicating to the tackle that you're going to be slanting down inside, running running into each other, that's a selfish thing, you know. Where you just and, and this is the thing that I this is the thing about this entire team. And I you know I started off you know this talk really talking about you know the defensive side, but I think across the board a lot of the mistakes that you're seeing is that this team realizes that it's not operating at optimal level because it's not operating at optimal level. When you're a team that's supposed to play here, and you're playing here, and what winds up happening is more times than not, you get guys that start trying to do too much. They start to try to do someone else's job. So if you got to play away and your defensive end is supposed to get up the field or make sure that nothing's coming back, he still got contained even if they run away from him. He's chasing down the line trying to do somebody else's job. That's not your play to make. That's not your job, okay? And defenses see the offenses see that, and they're going to make the adjustments. They're going to take advantage of those types of things, and it's things like that that get them in trouble. Trying to get an early kick on a predictive um, um, pass play, and then you get a false start. Um, you know, not moving your feet when you're blocking downfield, and you get a holding penalty. Um, you know, not getting in phase the right way and face guarding the wide receiver down the field and getting a holding call or getting a, a, a P.I. call. You know, all of these things are because, you know, they're out of position and their you know, fundamentals and their technique is so flawed at times. And then, and, then, and then it's a confidence thing, you know. And you play the way that they played, you know, the last three games, losing three in a row, all of a sudden your confidence begins to take a hit. You know, you don't want to be the guy. You don't want to be the guy this week that calls, that causes the team not to be able to get the job done. And then what winds up happening is because in, in every every penalty, in my opinion, almost 99% of them always comes down to guys being out of position 
and not being able to, to and, and knowing that they're out of position. And because they're out of they're out of position, now you gotta you gotta grab, you gotta hold. Now you know you gotta do something illegal because you know you're out of position, you know you're beat, and the fear sets in. Um, so it's it's I said it, you know, in a tweet yesterday, you know, after after I got off post game, you know, it's really frustrating to watch a team that has as much talent as this football team has. And, it, and, and there's this Jekyll and Hyde aura about them from time to time where you look at them and you think that they got it right and they're moving in the right direction. And then a snap of a finger, all of a sudden things go haywire and they look discombobulated, confused and in disarray all over again. Um, and you're starting to see some of it manifest itself on the sideline. The conversation that the cameras are picking up between Nick and the players and the players and the players and things of that nature. Um, it's just not a good look. And it's not a good feel. Now, I, I'm, I'm not here to preach doom and gloom. This football team is 11-4. and four. Um, There's a whole lot of other teams out there in the National Football League that would love to be um, – where this team is at this point in time but it goes beyond it in my opinion it's bigger than you know just being 11 and 4 because when you look at the baltimore ravens um that is a football team that shows you you know how you want to look and, and you know th this is the problem the problem i think defensively at least um is the fact that you know the eagles because they don't value linebackers and safeties, they kind of painted themselves in a corner of not having real playmakers in the middle of the field. So when you look at the Baltimore, the Baltimore Ravens, you know, they got two linebackers that potentially could be, you know, all pros this year. They got a safety, you know, in his second or the second year, I want to say, um, that's just playing lights out, especially when he's healthy. He's a playmaker, a playmaker. That's the problem with the Eagles. The Eagles have put so much emphasis on the offensive side of the football, you know, that they ignored the defensive side and devalued some of the most important um, positions in the name of, you know, building a, a great defensive line. You got to have that today and having cornerbacks. You got to have that as well. But you can't completely ignore the safeties and the linebackers because truly those are the guys that are really the true playmakers. Most of the plays that are made are play are made in the backfield by linebackers, or defensive tackles, or safeties that drop down in the box, or on plays in the middle of the field where guys are causing fumbles. When was the last time we caused a fumble? When, when was the last time a linebacker caused a fumble or safety caused a fumble? I think um the punch out by Bradbury, which was on the outside, was the last time that we caused a fumble. When was the last time, you know, we got an interception in the middle of the field? Because we lack so much talent in that area. And when you see these better defenses, when you see, you know, the Cleveland Browns, when you see the San Francisco 49ers and, you know, with Greenlaw and Warner, um, when you see the Baltimore Ravens and how they play and the players that they have there, um, great quote out today by Patrick King. Um, I reposted it on my Twitter page, um, talking about how everybody wants to play, you know, this pansy style of, of game, you know, like basketball on grass. And he says, we're not going to play that way. You know, we, we got a different standard, and this is how we play, and we're going to hit you in the mouth no matter what. That's the way defense is supposed to be played, you know. But I think the emphasis has gone so far on the defense, on the offensive side of the ball, that, you know, teams are putting the lion's share of their money on the offensive side so that they can score more points, you know. But you still got to stop somebody. Critical games will always come down to your ability to make plays and get stops, you know. And the Eagles don't do that well. They don't have enough playmakers in the middle. They don't, inst they don't instill fear in offensive teams to worry about throwing the ball over the middle or throwing the ball up the seam because they just don't have the talent in that area safety-wise and linebacker-wise to compensate and make plays. Playmakers is what they're missing. They got a ton of playmakers on the offensive side.
they rely on their defensive line and their two rush guys to be their playmakers on the defensive side of the ball. And when your two tackles are being double teamed every single play darn near because you're living, you're living primarily in four-man front to help out on the back end, and what winds up happening is some of those guys wind up getting, you know, eliminated or stagnant. It's hard when you're playing, you know, 50 plays a game and 45 of those plays, you got 300 pounds laying on you. You know, no wonder Fletcher is, is, is exhausted. No wonder you're not seeing, you know, Jordan Davis play at the level that he played at, at or Jalen Carter, you know, present the, the type of pressure up the middle that they need to have because they're, they're, they are, they get into a five man protection with the back in the backfield and you got six, what, seven guys to block four. So that means that you're going to have some scenarios and you're going to have some situations where you're not going to get a pass rush. And this team, quite frankly, does not have enough faith in the back end that they're going to bring blitzes at all, at all. Um, so it's going to be really interesting to see, you know, how this team continues to progress. Again, they're 11 and four, sitting right where they want to be. Everything that they need is right there in front of them. Um, and let's just see. Let's see, you know, how it all plays out. Um, like I said, I'm not here with doom and gloom, but you guys know me. I'm the type of person that that's like, you know, show me over a period of time who you are and how you play. And that's a future preview of what you're going to, the, the product you're going to put on the field down the road, you know, now could they flip a script? Absolutely. Do I see it? No, because they've been saying the same thing for the last 16 weeks that, you know, we got to get better. We got to do this better. We got to improve, you know, and they keep making the same mistakes again and again and again that, you know, proves to me that, you know, they, they may not be able to write this thing, you know, to get the perfect game. And that's okay. That, that's okay to the extent that, you know, they continue to win. I just feel like it's a much more difficult proposition once you get into the playoffs than it will be, um, than it will be in the regular season, all right? Okay, so let's take a quick break. Um, I got my man Shane. You, know, you guys need to follow him over on, um, on, on Twitter. This dude breaks down um, the game film-wise better than almost anybody that I've seen um, on social media. Shane Happ is going to join me. But before we get to Shane, we'll go to a quick break. I'm going to come back. I'm going to do a real quick, um, you know, whiteboard 101 to kind of give you guys some insight on why the Eagles are struggling in the run game, um, especially with the linebackers and the two tackles. And then we'll get to Shane and we'll break it down. He doesn't have his film yet, you know, for this week's game, but, you know, he knows what's going on. He sees what's happening with this team. And, you know, we'll delve into it and talk about, you know, what the Eagles can do to improve their situation and, um, you know, what's what's plaguing them thus far. Be back in a sec. When you open the Bet Parks app, you're in the zone. Winning is always a rush, but the money is in the moment. It's the confidence and underdogs covering, the tension before a clutch turnover, and the pride of a parlay paying off. It's another chance to win big with all-day action. Plus, win your first $10 bet and get $125 in sports bonus bets. You play for fun, you love to win. You bet. Bet Parks. If you understand that success is built on trusted relationships and dependable performance, MidPen Bank is the right bank for you. We're on a mission to prove that the right bankers can make a big difference. We work harder, we get things done, and we're in your corner. With financial centers strategically located throughout the greater Philadelphia region and new locations in central New Jersey, we're ready to bring you the best in commercial and personal banking. Call or visit us today to connect with a professional MidPen banker. Member FDIC. Go Eagles! Welcome to Bridgeview Partners, where IT and business innovation merge. We're not just another tech company. We're your strategic partner in navigating the ever-evolving digital landscape. Our team of experts tailors cutting-edge solutions to fit your unique needs, and ensuring your success is our top priority. Elevate your business with Bridgeview Partners. Discover the power of partnership and tech innovation today. Contact us now to experience the difference. Bridgeview Partners, where innovation meets excellence. Welcome back. You guys are watching the Seth Joyner Show, brought to you by Bet Parks. Make sure you download the Bet Parks app. Hey, listen, you love to play, you love to win, you bet Bet Parks. Um, 
So let's jump into, you know, this little whiteboard breakdown. I want to give you guys an idea of what's going on with the Eagles as far as their run game on defense is concerned. Um, like I said, they've been playing a lot of um, a lot of four man front, um, which can be difficult at times. You got Fletcher in the three here. And most of the time you've got either Jordan or Jalen Carter lined up, you know, in a two two I here or or. Yeah. Um, so then you got your linebackers. OK. And. Let's put the quarterback here and the running back here. OK, so first of all, let's understand gap responsibility. His the tackles gap responsibility is this B gap here. His gap responsibility is this A gap right here. OK, a lot is determined on the flow for the linebackers, the flow and where the player is actually designed to go. Most of the time when you're in, I would say 95% of the time when you're in um, shotgun and this back is offset here, you know, to this side, you know, this play is coming across the formation. So the fact that it's coming across the formation, this tight end is going to turn out, okay? You got your double team here. You got your here. And then you're going to get your double team here. Now, and then he's going to turn out here. So, the fact that he's coming across, let's deal with that first, okay? So if this is his gap right here, okay, the minute that that ball goes across, and the linebackers are late seeing this, this is part of the problem. They're late reading it, okay? His gap is this A gap right here. And the sooner that he can come down with his left arm, his left arm, and take this, take this double team off and get in this A gap over here, now that allows this tackle to play in that A gap right there. So now you got A gap, A gap taken care of, correct? Okay. So now this tackle is being double teamed. They're trying to get him here, which is fine because if, if this linebacker gets here outside arm free, he's got the entire B gap no matter how much he gets, he gets spread out here. But the minute that this running back steps this way, this linebacker has got to come downhill, same thing, outside arm free and take this guy off the double team. If he does that, now he's in this C gap here, and this tackle is in this B gap. Now you've got a wall across here, okay, that allows for the running back to have nowhere to run. Now, I know you guys are asking me, what about this B gap right here, okay? Whatever, wherever that safety is, he's the, that's his. That Any kind of cutback, that's his. That's his gap. He's contained. He's contained. OK, so let's let's erase it all off and start it again. And let me give you an idea of, you know, some of the issues that they're having and why, you know, they're struggling. OK, and three technique, two technique here, linebacker, linebacker. OK, so as a matter of fact, let's scrub him and put him here, which makes it even easier for the linebackers to be able to see flow. Yesterday, I seen Darius Leonard. They ran a ball. Quarterback got the snap, reversed out, handed him the ball right here. Darius Leonard ran right here, okay? They double teamed here and pushed. They got there, got him cut off. He worked up here, and the running back had this entire lane to run through because he ran through, okay? Now, he made a play early in the game, you know, that worked out for him. But the problem is you can't guess if you're you, you got to understand if that ball comes this way. The first thing you got to do is take take the double team off. If you don't take him off, they're just going to that's 300 pounds, 300 plus pounds on 300 pounds. They're going to run him out of there. So now they're reestablishing the 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 the, the line, the um, the line of scrimmage. Let me go back here. They're reestablishing on this double team and pushing the line of scrimmage back to here. And you're going to run through? Well, now they keep pushing him, okay? They get him moving, and now this guy comes up here. Or if they get him, what he's trying to do is get him moving this way. If they can get him moving that way and Shaq just runs himself out of the play, now this guy can turn and get the linebacker. Now they really got something to work with. The Eagles have got to figure this out. The linebackers got to figure this out. I'm sorry. There's just no way that, you know, they're going to be able to contain the run and get the run under control being playing linebacker the way that they are. And I, I get it. I understand. 
you know, you, you got some special teams guys that are playing. Van Sumeren's first, you know, first start. You know, Shaq Leonard knows better than this. You know, I think he was really trying to make a play. And sometimes when you make a play where you run through like that, you get the sense that that's going to be there all day. But you got to understand that teams are looking at that. They realize that you made that play running through early in the game. They're going to come back to it with a different mi mindset. Instead of that running back going wide, he's going to stay close to the double team. That's what good running backs do. Stay close to the big butts until you see them separate. And then when you see them separate, you want to hit right in between them. You know, but he made it easy for the running back, he made it easy for Saquon to make that read. If you can get that wall across, like I said, everybody's responsible for their gap. I always talk about this in, in, in run defense. If you can create that wall, everybody's in their gap and they're going to hold their gap. OK, the problem is how we're taught to actually play the run, get off the block, go make a play. So if I'm in my gap and I see that guy over there. You know, human nature wants to say, shed him and go over here and get him, you know. But in reality, if we all hold our gap and wait for the running back to commit, because the running back is waiting for the defense to commit. Saquon Barkley was waiting for Shaq Leonard to run through so he could cut that ball back. So sometimes when you overcommit as a linebacker, instead of getting where you're supposed to be and doing your job, you don't allow everybody else to do the job that they need to do. All right. That's our whiteboard breakdown 101 for the day. Um, let's bring in Shane. Um, Shane Hoff, how you doing, my friend? I'm doing great, Seth. How are you doing tonight? Man, listen, um, love your breakdown. Love your stuff, man. I look forward after every game. Um, and um, it's great to have you on, man. Um, give, me your, give me your assessment of where this – let's start with the offensive side of the ball because obviously, you know <clears> – <throat> That's the side of the ball that the Eagles are going to need to be more proficient at in order for them to get anywhere near where they want to go. They've got so many issues on the defensive side of the ball. It's going to be really difficult for them to make stops on the defensive side. But, you know, they're going to have to score points and they're going to have to get off to good starts. Um, they got off to a good start yesterday, but they haven't most of the year. Um, and from your your perspective, you know, I know we we see the game in similar fashion, you know, the shot plays downfield, they get them in trouble. But, you know, tell tell my listeners, you know, give my listeners an idea of, you know, how, you, how you've seen um, what the Eagles have been going through all year. Yeah, it, even over the three-game losing streak, I feel like the Eagles have come out of the gate well, which has been an improvement over the first part of the season where they seem to struggle early in games. Now, it hasn't always ended with, touchdowns you think back to the 49ers game they go back to back field goal drives you think to the Dallas game I think it was the Dallas game they drove the field and then they fumbled and I, I feel like the Eagles scripted plays have tended to work pretty well over the last month or so of the season it's once they get off of that script that things the wheels have stored have fallen off and I could guess as to what's going on with that I don't I don't really know but it seems like when they come come into the game with the game plan. The game plan works initially, and then it's stacking off of that throughout the game. Now, the Giants game, I thought they played... I mean, obviously, you get you know the pick six on Dallas Goddard slipping, and you get some weirdness with you know losing a possession on a kickoff fumble. And Generally, I thought the offense played really well in this game, and you can couch that and say, you know, it's just the Giants, and the Giants certainly aren't a good team. Um but offensively, I, I liked what I saw. Uh, they put up 465 yards. It, it was Jalen Hurts' first 300-yard passing game since October. Um, Jalen Hurts was used as a runner, not a lot, but effectively when he was used, which I think is really key for the offense going into the playoffs. Um, and they put up 33 points despite that interception that I mentioned and settling for four field goals. Uh, you know, two inside the red zone and then one from the 25 and the 26. So generally they were moving the ball well, um, which is encouraging to see, especially against a, a real blitz heavy team. And we know that gives the Eagles problems at times. And I thought it gave the Eagles problems at times in this game. You saw Jalen Hurts average depth of target plummet, getting the ball out fast horizontally seems to be their go-to against, you know, the Giants pressure packages. Um there's not really a team they'll face in the playoffs that are going to play like the Giants do with the exception of maybe the Vikings if they get there. Um, so maybe not the best game in terms of a litmus test for 
what they're going to be able to do in the playoffs. You're going to face a more traditional offense next week against the Cardinals. Excuse me, I said offense, a more traditional defense. Um, and you should be able to light them up as well. There's not a lot of talent on that defensive roster. Uh, obviously, you know, weird things happen with Jonathan Gannon on the way out. Probably some hard feelings along the way there. Um, so you'd really like to see them come out and, you know, put up 40 a- against the Cardinals this week. It would make me feel a little bit better. Well, let, let's let's stay there as far as the blitz is concerned because <clears throat> Jonathan Gannon, you know, was lauded for, you know, not being a guy that would bring pressure last year. And in, in my opinion, um, I believe it cost the Eagles the Super Bowl that they, you know, were adamantly against, you know, bringing pressure because they had gotten so many sacks last year. Fast forward, Jonathan Gannon is now the head coach of the Arizona Cardinals. He's down there, you know, looking like the reincarnation of Buddy Ryan, the way he's blitzing down there. And you also got to realize that, you know, teams are starting to come after Jalen because they realize that the Eagles really don't sight adjust to blitz to blitzing situations. They try to pick it up when they see the blitz coming or they 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 view the, the blitz as an opportunity to hit the home run to get the explosive play down the field. Which drives me crazy because you got Dallas got it one on one in a blitz situation last week. The guy over his head, he was, you know, removed from the box. The guy over his head, you know, came on the blitz and the safety, you know, dropped down to pick him up. And instead of him just hooking up at 10 yards, he's running a go route. You know, when his guy is going on the blitz, that's normally a sight adjustment in every offense in the National Football League, with the exception of the Eagles. The Eagles just don't sight adjust. And it drives me crazy. Um, and now you're, you're counting on Jalen to say, okay, you know, that one guy, I'm responsible for that one guy. I'm responsible to make that one guy miss. And now I got to work some magic where you can force defenses to get out of that mindset if you would just sight adjust and take, you know, the short play and hope that you get some, some rack yards or some yak yards. The Eagles don't do that. And I don't understand why. Yeah, I don't really either. It's been a critique I've had of the offense all the way back to the beginning of last season. I remember talking about that in an all 22 breakdown of the Lions game week one last year that that just wasn't a part of the offense. And it feels like at times last year, the mentality was Jalen Hurts can make one guy miss and then we just run our normal play and we've got one on ones all over the field. But This year, they've seemed to try to get him to avoid contact. You know, he slides down behind the line of scrimmage at times on these read option plays and things like that. And so it doesn't make sense to me that they're not building that in. And then at times when they do, because it's not never there. It certainly wasn't on the example you're talking about. I know exactly which one you're talking about. Um, But then when they do, it's almost like they will let the free runners come off the right side but Hertz is trying to throw it hot to the left side. And that's also one I just don't get. Like I, I would rather to me, I would rather throw at that blitzer so I can see him. I don't have to confirm he's coming and then get my eyes across the field. And I, I'd be curious to get your take on that because the only rationale I can come up with is that Jalen just doesn't like it that way. And maybe it relates to the amount of like tipped interceptions he's had, especially on those RPO looks. Do you think that's why? Uh, when they do build those in, it's typically on the opposite side of the free runner. Yeah, probably. I mean, I can't tell you how many balls he's had tipped with the guy coming off the edge and trying to throw into that. Um, he's even had some interceptions, you know, to that side. So, you know, I, I guess the thought process is go away from it more so than go to it. You know, I'm more in the in the camp of, you know, if you're not going, if you're going to let him come as a free runner, f- fake the throw. Nine and a half times out of 10, the guy's going to jump and then get outside of him and try to make something happen outside of the pocket. Because if you can get outside of the pocket, not only do you have the opportunity for big play, but you also have the opportunity to take off and run, you know, with a safety that's probably 30 yards deep. That he's the only one that can react. Everybody else has got their back to the quarterback. Um, but I just think, that you know, Shane, when, when I looked at them yesterday, they came out and and they pretty much they did what, you know, both you and I and, you know, everybody else that's been analyzing this offense, they've been doing, they came out doing, you know, what we said that they should do. Just take what the defense is giving you. You know, it takes time for you to get to a place where you can force a defense into the look that you want 
so that you can get those explosive plays down the field. And there's a lot of talk about it last week. You know, when the offensive line starts talking about explosive plays, you know you got a problem. Jason Kelsey talked about it last week. Oh, we just need more explosive plays, you know, more big plays down the field. I'm like, no, you don't, you know, because that mentality is what's gotten you, you know, gotten this offense where it is to the point where they're so, um, you know, inconsistent because you're trying to hit the big play all the time. What is wrong with the, you know, yesterday they had an 18-play drive um that resulted in a field goal obviously the second the the first series of the game with the kobe punt return they only had two plays and they get in the, get in the end zone and then their last possession they get another field goal off of 11 an 11 play drive then they had a 14 play drive in their seventh possession there's nothing wrong with that it's almost like they don't want to they don't want to have these possessions that shorten the game and gives them op- now they got to be better in the red zone they're only two for five yesterday you know and that's why you see you know these field goals but from my perspective, if you you're going to have more opportunities to put the ball in the end zone when you just when you run the ball effectively, a short passing game. A couple of times, Jalen impressed me. He took the dump off, you know, with the, to the back out of the backfield with Kenneth Gainwell. There's nothing wrong with that. But they just they are like in love and just intoxicated on this explosive play thing. And when it's not there, it just puts them in the most the the most egregious situations. Sometimes, you know. Third and three, and they come with a blitz. And instead of you, you know, having an option route, I, I, I like to see them, you know, use Alameda Zacchaeus. And 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 they gave Britton Covey a, a bubble screen pass yesterday. The guy is shifted. He's your punt returner. Put him in as an option route runner in the slot in your four four wide receiver in your ten personnel, and allow him to run an option route that gets you a first down in those situations rather than having to throw a 50 50 ball down the field and then wind up having to punt. It just makes no sense to me. Yeah. I feel like the Eagles are going through a bit of what, you know, Patrick Mahomes and the chiefs went through Joe Burrow and the Bengals went through a couple of years ago because NFL defenses got so obsessed with preventing explosive plays, you know, the advent of uh, split field safety looks, the Vic Fangio system really coming back and, Last year, the Eagles didn't have to deal with that because they were such a dominant team running the football that it really dictated to teams that you're going to have to stack the box. You're going to have to go single high. You're going to have to drop an extra guy into the box to be able to stop our rushing attack. And now once you do that, we like our shots with A.J. Brown vertical. We like to you know take one-on-ones to Devonta Smith. And last year, that worked really well. And it feels like this year, defenses decided we're going to stop doing that we're going to play neutral or light boxes and we're going to make you beat us rushing. And the Eagles haven't been able to do that. And I think some of that comes down to offensive line play. The offensive line hasn't been as good in run blocking as we're accustomed to seeing in Philadelphia. Some of it probably comes down to Jalen hurts reticence to run at times, whether that be injury related or not. Um, But the Eagles are still fixated on those explosive plays. They haven't, caught up with the rest of the league offensively in doing these methodical drives, which is a shame because like you mentioned, when they do, they're good at it. Like it, mm-hmm. They're good at hitting, you know, AJ Brown, 10 yard curl routes, Devonte Smith, comeback routes, those slant routes. They can work that offense. And yet it seems like they're just not patient enough to do so. And even if they're patient enough for one or two drives, defenses can continue to play over the top. And eventually the Eagles are going to go big play hunting. I mean, Everybody, Nick Sirianni, uh, Jason Kelsey, like you mentioned, they're telling you, this is what we want. And so if I'm a defensive coordinator, I'm just going to play those two high shells and I'm going to force you to do those 12 play drives because I'm going to assume at some point you're going to get bored and start big play hunting. Well, it's it's a sad state. You know, I, I, I want to transition over to the defensive side of the ball. You made a point about, you know, the Vic Fangio I'm crazed that everyone's on. Um, I watched two defenses last night in the Baltimore Ravens and the San Francisco 49ers. Man, you talk about throwback. Um, The Baltimore Ravens defense, they got some great linebackers. They got a great safety. Um, Not only can they rush the passer with some of the players that they have on the defensive side of the ball, but they're still uber aggressive in the blitz game. Um, And they don't worry about, you know, big plays because they realize that they can make big plays to compensate if they do give up one Philadelphia Eagles and most team in the na- teams in the national football league. Now they're so afraid of playing an aggressive brand of football, 
a physical brand of football. And um, there was a quote that, that I saw today on YouTube from Patrick Queen that said, you know, everybody wants to play basketball on grass now. We don't play that way. You know, we're going to hit you in the mouth. We're going to make you feel us. And that's the way, you know, that we're going to play. Um, it, it's funny because, you know, before the Eagles played the 49ers, you know, I made a statement that the 49ers are a finesse team. Now, they can get physical when they want to get physical in their running game. But their offense basically is a finesse style offense. It's kind of it's kind of developed off of, you know, Joe Gibbs old offense, um, you know, where they're going to run the ball and they've got great coordination off their run plays with pass plays that mirror those run plays. But they're they're, they're a finesse team. And you saw, you know, as much as the game has changed, as much as the league has changed, you know, uh, the way that you beat a finesse football team is you hit them in the mouth and you beat them up physically And the Baltimore Ravens just took San Francisco to the woodshed last night. Um, why is it that most teams, why, why have teams, you know, shied away from that? You know, is it the rules change? Is it just, you know, the philosophy of bending but don't break in that mindset and that mind, that, that, that style of playing that says we're going to give you what you want between the 20s and then you, we're going to get aggressive from the 20 in. Why give up that much real estate? It makes no sense to me. Yeah, I think it's largely because it's just a copycat league and, you know, people saw uh, Lou Anarumo in Cincinnati do that to the Chiefs and beat them in a playoff game. And, uh, you know, you saw teams do that to the Bengals, which is hilarious to me that the Bengals defense was doing that to Patrick Mahomes. And at the same time, their offense was struggling with it. Uh, you would think if you would be good at anything, it would be the style of defense your defense plays. But um, I think it's a copycat league. And you saw this work against these good quarterbacks against the Josh Allens and the Patrick Mahomeses, And so it's what the league starts to follow to. And there's just, I mean, there's a cyclical nature to the league and, you know, the rules obviously don't do defenses, any, uh, any favors with, you know, how pass interference is legislated and defensive holding and things like that. But, um, you know, it, it, it works, but it can't be your only thing. Like that's the biggest thing for me. You can't play a static defense. You know, even when back to when Jim Schwartz was in Philadelphia, that was always my issue with Jim Schwartz. It was the single high, a lot of cover three zone coverage. You're leaving your corners on islands. We're going to rush with four B plus one in the box. And you had a great pass rush, but there was no counter punch. There's no getting up on receivers. And so teams eventually just schemed. Let's get the ball out really fast. And there were so many games I watched with Jim Schwartz in Philadelphia where the pass rush was entirely negated. And, you know, now it's the same sort of thing. Like, the Eagles, they, they've tried some different things. Now, the talent on the defense isn't as good as it used to be. Like, you know, we talked about the offense and the offense needs to win these football games. Like your best case scenario to go make a run is the offense needs to operate at an elite level. The defense needs to get a couple well-timed stops. And that's just the modern NFL as well. But especially when you've got, you know, the injuries and the, the aging guys in the secondary that the Eagles have, um, the thing that annoys me the most about the Eagles defense is I can tell you before third down, almost every time what the Eagles are going to do, we're going to line up and show cover two man. And we're going to spin into cover one robber ad nauseum. Like, <laughs> and, and you just, you don't have, you don't, I don't know. The Eagles are one of the worst third down teams in the NFL. And we just keep doing the same thing over and over and over. And I thought that might change with the play caller switch. And it really hasn't like, I haven't got to chart out this game, but charting out, you know, last week's game against the Seahawks, I can pr almost every third down, it was show too high, spin to cover one man and, and get beat on a slant route, get beat on a double move. And um, just need more variety, whatever it is, whatever you're going to major in is fine, but you've got to have a counter punch, something else you can throw. And that's something I think that, you know, Mike McDaniel does so well with the Ravens and uh, you know, the 49ers do so well. And of course not everybody's got a Fred Warner over the middle of the field or a Kyle Hamilton. Uh, play in the star, but there's, there, it's gotta be a more of a varied approach. And, and that's something you mentioned, you know, the Eagles needed to blitz more last year and it would have been nice to have that punch to throw in the Super Bowl. It's hard to have that throw that punch in the Super Bowl if you haven't thrown it all season. And, and that's, that's where it, it comes down to me is you've got to try different things. And I think the Eagles have tried different things this year at times. It, none of it's worked very well. Well, we're speaking the same language. You know, the problem is, you know, you can't. And, and this was I took a lot of heat last year 
you know, leading up to the Super Bowl, talking about the Eagles not rushing, not not blitzing, you know, and everybody was like, oh, well, you don't need to blitz. You know, they're on 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 pace to, you know, break not only, you know, your record, you know, when you were with the Eagles the, for the sacks on the year, but they're also on pace, you know, for the the record in the league. Um, and lo and behold, you know, you get to the Super Bowl and to your point, you can't begin to do something you know, late in the season that you haven't practiced or become very efficient at during the regular season, you know, so you have to have all of these different things, you know, that's why when you look at a play sheet, you know, for offensive coordinator, he's got all of these different sections with all of this different stuff and three quarters of that stuff, he might not even run, you know, but you got it there, you prepared for it. So if you need to pull it out, you know, then you can use it. Um, the problem is the Eagles don't have good blitz and linebackers. They're very predictive, you know, when they are coming, you know, either the linebackers walked up outside or he's walked up inside. I can't tell you how many times I got tired of watching Shaq Leonard line up over the center yesterday and they didn't send him one damn time. I'm like, if you're going to line him up, you know, at some point in time, the protection is going to start, you know, to disregard him even being up there. You've got to send him at least one time to make them believe that he's going to come. Just because he's sugaring up there doesn't mean that he's actually coming. And then also it puts him at a disadvantage to get back in coverage because that's five less yards that he's got, five more yards, I should say, that he has to cover to get back to his landmark, you know, in zone in zone drops. Um, and I get it. You know, Nick Sirianni is just hell-bent on not giving up um, big plays. But, you know, they have given up big plays. They've given up explosive plays. You know, they gave up one last week against the Giants. They gave up one, um, you know, it, against – they gave up multiple ones against the 49ers um, in that loss. They gave up, you know, some big ones against the Giants. So the thing that, to me, the thing that w – when it becomes your focus, you know, to not give up the big play, and you're always talking about it, you know, that becomes the thing that that manifests itself, you know, instead of stressing – you know, good technique and good coverage. We want to stress: don't give up the big play. You know, so the thing that you focus on, on it, in on the thing that you pay the most attention to is the thing that you know that you bring to life. And the Eagles play in that manner. That's why I always say they're so passive in what they do. You know, even from the cornerbacks and the DB standpoint. You know, if you don't instill some kind of confidence in those guys and belief that those guys can stand up and blitz coverage or in man coverage sometimes, when you put them in that situation, it, there, there's a psychological thing that happens in your mind. Well, man, I don't want to be the one to give it up. I got to make sure I don't give up the big play. And invariably, you get a double move and a guy gets beat, you know, for a big play. It doesn't make sense to me. You know, and to your point, yeah, it's okay to have these coverages, these safe coverages that you play. It's okay, you know, to give one look, you know, give a two-man look and then drop Sidney Jones down, you know, in the, in, in the box you know, on the snap of the ball and rotate, you know, and, and play, you know, one one robber with the guy trying to get something done in the middle of the field because that's where you've been most vulnerable most of the season is across the middle. I understand why they're doing it. But, you know, why not every once in a while bring a blitz? Why not drop Sidney Jones down, you know, and pick up that back coming out of the backfield? Now you got an extra back. Seeing both of the backers and then drop him down late. Or sit. when was the last time we seen a slot blitz? somebody coming off the edge. Everything comes right up the middle. There's no imagination. There's no creativity to what they do. And because they don't do it, the offenses aren't looking at it like, oh, we got to protect against it or we got to we got to prepare against it. It's like Patrick Mahomes in the Super Bowl last year. The last thing he, that he ever had to worry about, it wasn't a thought. You weren't trying to challenge him, you know, intellectually at all by not blitzing him because he knew that he could set the pressure, he, he could set the protection, and realized that there was never going to be any pressure other than the four guys that were coming or five guys if they got down the five-man front, and that he had to make no adjustment to hurry up and get the ball, no side adjustments or anything. That's too easy for a guy as intelligent as Patrick Mahomes. Yeah, and I mean, another problem too is just when the Eagles do blitz, they're really bad at it. Um, you mentioned the linebackers aren't good at blitzing, and you, to me, when you have linebackers that aren't very good at blitzing, and I put out a clip after the Cowboys game just showing I split screened an Eagles cover zero blitz, both backers coming, and a Cowboys cover zero bits blitz with both backers coming. And you just see how much quicker 
the Cowboys linebackers get across the line of scrimmage and impacted the play. If you've got linebackers that aren't very good blitzing, put them on the line and send them. Don't try to send them from depth. Like put them up on the line, put them in both of the A gaps and actually send them. The Eagles will show those double A gap looks. Yeah, they showed it several times, like you mentioned with Shaquille Leonard in this game, but they never send him. They back him off. And at a certain point, like I'm a huge fan of sim pressures. It, it doesn't do anything if you don't actually ever send them. It's almost like uh, if an Eagles linebacker is on the line of scrimmage, you can be absolutely positive he's going to drop into coverage. But if he's five yards off, maybe he's going to come and it's just going to be too slow. It's not going to get there. Um, and there's there's an element too of you've got to be able to marry your your pass rush your blitz packages with your coverage because again a lot of and you're rolling the dice we don't want to give up a big play but if you're going to send your backers up the middle and you're playing cover zero man but we're sitting ten yards off the ball it's just too easy for the quarterback to negate that getting the ball out eventually you got to roll the dice at some point like just blitzing with big off coverage like. Maybe if it's on third and 15, you know, we want to play sticks defense and send pressure, but you're not really a, con- you just got like a foot in the blitzing camp. You can't ride the fence. You're not going to get anywhere. Like roll the dice. I-, I love, I love watching the Vikings defense. What, what, what Brian Flores is doing this year, like leads the league and in, in max blitz rate leagues, the league and lead and drop eight rate. And I'm not saying that's what the Eagles should do but I think it's a really innovative thing. And I think you could mix that in some more. I mean, the, the Eagles never rush three. Um, they, they blitz at one of the lower rates in the league. And when they do blitz, it's almost always like a, a straight rush five play cover one man without your whole defender. And I just don't think that does much for you as the Eagles, like the Eagles have, you know, Hassan Reddick, Josh sweat. They've got all these pass rushers that are highly touted rushing a fifth guy. That just guarantees you five one-on-ones and you expect, even if you've only got two or three one-on-ones for somebody to win. Like if you're going to blitz to me, you need to go plus one. You got to try to get that free runner or at least, you know, make them keep the back end, make them react to what you're doing. And I just don't think offenses have to do that when your idea of blitzing is just sending five. They rather slit their wrist than the, <laughs> than the go zero blitz. They just really, really will would, you know, and I mean the proper way to play it, like in some of these third and like really long situations, you play your cornerbacks, you know, five yards off the receiver. You know, you're, you're keying the receiver, not looking in the backfield, but you're keying the receiver, knowing that you're sending one more than they can actually pick up and that ball has to come out hot. It's got to come out fast right now. And now you just make the tackle. I think the other part, the other reason why they're afraid to, you know, to implement some of that stuff is that there's such bad tacklers on the back end as well. They know that if they missed that tackle. Here we go again. That's an explosive play that we don't necessarily want to give up. All right. So before we before I let you go, Shane, let's um, um, last question. Give me your opinion, you know, of this whole Sean decide to the booth and uh, Matt Patricia taking over the play caller because it was pretty evident. You know, we talked they talked about it last week in some press conferences that this isn't you know, Matt Patricia is basically running um, Sean Desai's defense. Um, now, he's done some things different uh, um, based upon what they've been running all year long. But two things. What good does it do to make the change if you're going to run the same stuff? That's the first thing. The second thing is, why even make it public, you know, and create another dynamic, you know, for the players and the team to have to go through? If they're going to do it this way, they could have just said, oh, we're going to move the side to the box, give him a better vantage point to see the game. And, you know, he and Matt Patricia, he's going to send the calls through Matt Patricia. You didn't have to make a big deal about it, you know. So now you got somewhat of this split as far as, you know, the players are concerned. They asked Darius Leonard last week, you know, Darius Slay last week. Oh, you know, um, what do you think about, oh, you know, we failed the guy. You know, we didn't get it done. That, that doesn't help the team. I mean, what did they really hope to accomplish by making this switch in week 14, week 15 of the season if he's running the same stuff? I don't see that great of a you know advantage in actually doing it. Your thoughts? Yeah. Well, first of all, I feel like they did try to kind of hide it, and it just kind of came out 
um, it real cagey how it handled how it was handled. Um, it's almost like they didn't want anybody to know. Um, as for what they hope to accomplish, it's tricky. Like ten and what were they? Ten and three at the time. Ten and two. Mm-hmm. Something. Th- those teams aren't typically letting go of a coordinator, uh, especially you know a, a younger guy that you brought in, and you know he's going to be learning on the job a little bit. And that was just a weird dynamic. Uh, it almost felt like bringing Matt Patricia into the building at the beginning of the year was like your fallback plan. And, and the merit I could see to it, I guess, if I was going to try to spin it, is you know if you think Sean Desai's defense is good, but man, he just struggles in the flow of the game to string the right calls together. Similar to what we talked about with the offense, like the scripted, the scripted openings have been good and then it loses something. Maybe you just think, you know, Desai is really good with coming up with these game plans, but he just doesn't quite have his, you know, finger on the pulse of when to call things in the game. Maybe that could be your solution. Uh, I really just think they were looking at what was happening, saying we're, we're one of the worst teams in the NFL on third down. You know, over the last four or five weeks, we've been one of the worst defenses in the NFL. We want to make a change, but we're not going to throw our chest into it and like declare it to everybody. We're just going to kind of try to hide it and hope for something different. And uh, I I don't know. I, I was real conflicted when it happened because I, I had seen a lot of things I didn't like from Desai. It's just not typically the way you see a 10 and two, 10 and three team behave. And so uh, I don't know. I don't, I still am unsure how I feel about it. Like, is that panicking? Is it an overreaction? Is it you saying like, this just isn't working and we don't want to waste the rest of the season. I mean, it, it, it could, I guess it depends on how it turns out. And I'm a big process over results guy. So I hate to say that, but uh, this <laughs> is one that we're probably going to have to have a little bit of hindsight after the season to be able to accurately judge how it went down. Well, I think that, <laughs> I think that the Eagles organization are really high on insurance policies. Um, you know, I, I believe that uh, Jim Schwartz was an insurance policy for Doug Peterson. Lo and behold, in year two, Peterson wins the Super Bowl. That negates that. Um, <clears throat> and I feel like, you know, um, Matt Patricia was an insurance policy for them as far as, um, you know, Sean Desai was, was concerned. But you're talking about two different defenses run two different ways with different philosophies. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you know, you had that guy in the in the locker room and in the meeting rooms all year long since training camp, since the offseason, you know, kind of, you know, mirroring uh, Sean Desai. But that doesn't necessarily mean he understands his defense in totality and how to really implement it. So it, it's, it's just, you know, you talk about conflicting. It's conflicting to me to understand you know how do how do you put together your calls and then how do you add to something that's not truly yours you know because what happens is most defensive coordinators over the years you know they start off in quality control and they work their way up and they're taking little bits and pieces from every organization and every dc that they work with and then they create their own you know map they create their own blueprint for what they want their defense to look like um that's not something that you're getting out of matt patricia because you know it's, it's out there, you know, I'm running Sean Desai's defense. He made no qualms about it, you know? So it's just one of those tough situations. And I'm just, I'm, I'm curious how it's going to continue to play itself out because <clears throat> I got to believe that there are some players on that defense that really feel some kind of allegiance to Sean Desai and, you know, some that, that don't. And that's just not a great dynamic to have, you know, when you're trying to, you know, chase down, you know, a Super Bowl. Hey guys, make sure that you got, give my man Shane, have a um, a follow at you know you see it right there in his box down there is on YouTube. Um, he'll have his all twenty two tomorrow, so I'm sure you're gonna have some stuff for us to dissect. You know, you know I'm gonna be looking forward and commenting on it. Um, you know, you talked about that blitz where you put those two next to each other. I did see that, um, and the thing you know in, in closing, the thing that I saw with the Dallas linebackers and the way that they blitz, they had great anticipation. You know, when you're when you're a blitzing team, a blitzing linebacker, if you're going to try to sell it from off, then you got to anticipate the the snap count and anticipate it well. But you also got to be going with your hair on fire. Those linebackers were like coming, you know, like there was gold in the backfield and they was going to get it all. Our linebackers, they 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 blitz like they're not even sure which gap they're supposed to hit sometimes. And that hesitation a lot of times and, and that example that you put up, they I think it was um, Zach Cunningham actually came free 
-hmm. on that blip. But he was so slow getting there that, you know, um, Dak had a chance to get the ball out where if he would have timed it up the proper way, you know, it would have either been a throwaway or a sack. So um, you guys just tune in to this guy. He's got some good stuff each and every week. A lot of learning going on. Sean, Shane, I appreciate your time, man. And um, thanks for being on the Seth Jordan show. Thanks, man. I appreciate you. Yeah, thanks for bringing me on, Seth. Happy to come on yeah. anytime. All right, man. Happy holidays to you. Have a good All right, guys, that's the show for this week. Um, make sure you continue to um, like, um, comment, um, share, and most importantly, please subscribe. I appreciate, you know, the continued support. Um, as always, you know, you guys be good to each other and take care of each other. But most importantly, make sure that you love each other. Um, happy 2000 and prosperous 2024 to you all. You guys be careful out there. See you next week after we hopefully get this Cardinals victory and finish up the regular season against the, the Giants up in New Jersey next week. All right. You guys take care. See you back here next week. Same place, same time. Peace. Are you selling your investment real estate? Are you interested in deferring your tax with the 1031 exchange? At RevX, we're experts in 1031 exchange planning and the use of passive real estate options using DSTs. Not in the midst of an exchange and want to invest in real estate, but don't know where to start? Revolution X has institutional grade real estate options for any size investor right now. Set up a consultation at RevXWealth.com. RevX, defer the tax, maximize the gain. At Mandrakia Law, we win big personal injury cases, but we always tell our clients up front that those cases almost always hinge on how much insurance coverage people or companies have. At Mandrakia Law, we don't sell insurance, but we're experts at helping our clients make sure they have the right insurance to protect their businesses and families. Do you have the right insurance? Most people don't. For a consultation, visit mmattorneys.com or call 610-584-0700. Mandrakia Law, aggressive attorneys who get the job done. This is Seth Joyner, top analyst for the birds. I've also analyzed the best auto dealerships, and I drive a Davis Honda. Fall into savings at Davis Honda. Over 300 cars available. And right now, get rates as low as 0.9% at Davis Honda in Burlington. Plus, you'll get two years of free oil changes on every new and used Davis Honda vehicle. See why Davis Honda continues to win outstanding awards for sales and service, including the highest award from Honda, the President's Award. Get to Davis Honda in Burlington. Fall into savings at Davis Honda. J.P. Mascaro and Sons is a family-owned, locally operated, Operated solid waste service company in business for over 60 years. You've seen the red trucks with the blue elephant that symbolizes strength and reliability. Mascaro is different than other national brands. Like the birds, Philadelphia is home. They'll take care of all your waste removal needs. They have it all. An experienced workforce, state-of-the-art equipment, a cutting-edge recycling center, and their own disposal facilities. Call 888-MASCARO or visit jpmascaro.com.